this week on the show, is 7-hydroxymetragenine really the next opioid epidemic? And how did we go from an all-natural herbal painkiller to a product the FDA wants to put on the list of controlled substances? Hey, I'm Laurel Bristow, and this is Health Wanted. Each week, we cover your need-to-know public health topics and break down the science behind them in our pursuit of better health. The opioid crisis in America has spanned 35 years with devastating consequences. Since the introduction and promotion of synthetic opioids like OxyContin in the early 90s, the epidemic of addiction and overdose has taken the form of a hydra. Each time the supply of a particular substance is stymied, another pops up to take its place. Heroin use increased as prescribing practices tightened for synthetic opioids, and then fentanyl replaced heroin use, and then polysubstance use outpaced fentanyl alone. And now, the FDA is sounding the alarms about what they say could be the next opioid epidemic. Like heroin, the alkaloid is derived from a natural source. It's the result of the metabolization of metragenine, a component of the leaves from the kratom tree. Unlike heroin or oxycodone or fentanyl, though, This substance is widely available in gas stations, vape shops, and online stores. No prescription or back alley dealings required. But is it actually going to be the next big contributor to an overdose epidemic that's just begun to decline for the first time in years? As always, to explain where we are today, we first have to go back. Kratom is a tree native to Southeast Asia. Just a note about pronunciation, some people say kratom, some say kratom. Dr. Oliver Gunderman, who is one of the earliest researchers in the field, says kratom because the native pronunciation puts emphasis on the second syllable, kratom. So that's what I'm going to do, or at least try to do. As everyone who works on this show knows, I'll practice pronunciation and then immediately forget it the second we start rolling. Its formal name is Metragena speciosa, and people who live in the areas where the plant is native have chewed the leaves or made tea from them to relieve pain and increase energy for probably centuries. I say probably because kratom was first described by a Dutch botanist who traveled to Southeast Asia in the 1830s, but just because he was the first to describe it doesn't mean it wasn't being used before then, you know? The effects of kratom are dose-dependent. A little bit of kratom can feel like a stimulant, and a lot of kratom can feel more like a pain-relieving sedative. And that second part has been of particular interest to people who are struggling with opioid substance use disorders. See, the main active alkaloid in kratom is metragenine, and in 1996, researchers discovered the compound worked as a partial opioid agonist. We define opioids not by any specific chemical structure, but by how the compounds interact with our opioid receptors. And metragenine was found to bind to opioid receptors, but more weakly than other opioids. The researchers discovered this by giving mice various doses of metragenine and either pinching their tails or putting them on a hot plate to see if they responded by biting or squeaking, indicating discomfort. Pretty rude. The mice on metragenine did not respond the same way they had at baseline, indicating their response to pain was limited. But they didn't act the way they did on morphine, meaning that they weren't as sedate. And their lack of response was undone when they were administered the anti-opioid drug naloxone. And if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably an opioid. Kratom has been used in Southeast Asian countries as a self-medication treatment for opioid use disorders. So it's only natural that people with substance use issues in the U.S., who were maybe looking for treatment options outside of a healthcare system that only offered replacement therapies like methadone, began to catch on that this might be a safer alternative to opioids. Kratom does have a risk of tolerance, meaning it takes more and more kratom to feel the effect of the substance, and that can potentially lead to issues if someone takes too much. Seizures have been reported in a few cases of extremely high kratom use. And there's a risk of dependence. Though addiction has been found to be fairly mild and includes withdrawal symptoms like nausea, difficulty sleeping, anxiety, headache, muscle aches, and agitation, which sounds very unpleasant but not terribly different than what someone who is trying to kick high caffeine use might go through. Kratom is actually part of the coffee family of plants. It's certainly more mild than withdrawal from regular, full opioid use. But deaths from kratom alone appear to be incredibly low. From 2011 to 2017, there were only 11 deaths reported related to kratom use, and nine of those involved other drugs. By comparison, there were about 200,000 opioid-related deaths in the same time frame. 
Kratom's supporters felt it was a viable harm reduction tool and were less than pleased when the Drug Enforcement Administration tried to take it away. In 2016, the DEA announced that they'd be placing both metragenine and 7 hydroxymetragenine into Schedule 1 for substances that have a high risk of dependency and no known medical value, effectively making Kratom illegal. The public backlash was immediate and strong. Pro-Kratom groups decried the attack on what was seen as one of few safe and accessible options for opioid use disorder treatment. And the advocacy worked. In a fairly unprecedented move, the DEA backed off and posted a letter announcing its intent to withdraw the plans to schedule these two substances. Which brings us to July of 2025, when FDA head Marty Makari announced the agency would be requesting that the DEA schedule 7-hydroxymetragenine specifically, not Kratom, under the Controlled Substances Act, which would limit its availability. In the intervening years between 2016 and 2025, several states had regulated Kratom themselves. Some made Kratom or its components Schedule One substances in the state. Some restricted the age of purchase to 18 or 21. Some made labeling requirements that I'm sure are perfectly followed to AT. But the regulations aren't uniform. And while at the federal level, Kratom cannot lawfully be marketed as a drug, dietary supplement, or food additive, it's still not technically illegal. But what has really changed over recent years is what we tend to talk about when we talk about Kratom. I mentioned it at the top of the show, but Kratom has about 25 alkaloids. Those are the components of the plant that cause it to have a physiological effect on people who take it. And there are two main alkaloids that we talk about when we talk about the Kratom plant. There's metragenine, which makes up the majority of the alkaloids in the plant and is a fairly weak opioid agonist. And then there's 7-hydroxymetragenine, or 7-OH. C7-OH has been found in some kratom plants, though it varies plant to plant and never seems to exceed 2% of the total alkaloids. And it's also a metabolite of metragenine, meaning that when someone ingests kratom, their body breaks down some of the metragenine into 7-OH. But you get a very small amount of the compound from the actual plant, which is important because 7-OH has been found to bind more strongly to opioid receptors than morphine, about 14 to 22 times more strongly. Actual kratom is usually sold as a capsule or powder to be mixed into juice or tea, but these days you can walk into a vape shop or gas station and see a variety of pills, gummies, powders to add to a water bottle, or mini energy shots, all labeled as premium kratom alkaloids, but containing 10 to 25 milligrams of 7-OH per serving, which is up to 500% more than you would ever get from using an actual kratom plant. It's like saying a potent 15 milligram THC gummy is from natural hemp extracts. These products are about as close to Kratom as an Erewhon smoothie with 80 grams of sugar is to a health food. But advertisers know that we love products from a natural source and have a strong aversion to opioids, and they're applying that principle to synthesize 7-OH products. One study found that 92% of these enhanced 7-OH products still marketed themselves as being derived from Kratom. The effects of the substance also have a wide variety of marketing claims, from causing euphoria or relaxation to an increased buzz or improved focus, while others are marketed with language that more explicitly informs users of the opioid-like effects. Big and varied claims about what the substance can do for you, especially when you consider that 7-OH concentrates have never been studied in humans before. The inconsistency or deceptive marketing could be contributing to an increase in people using a substance they're not prepared for. There has been a nine times increase in calls to poison control centers regarding Kratom products over the last 10 years. A study of drug intoxication related mortality in Florida from 2020 to 2021 found that 551 deaths tested positive for metragenine. Though most deaths involved multiple drugs, 36 tested positive for metragenine alone. That's far more than the two deaths from 2011 to 2017. And it also indicates that use of metragenine-containing substances could actually put someone at higher risk of overdose when used with other drugs, rather than being a harm reduction tool. But there are caveats to this data. The National Poison Data System only added a classification code for 7-OH products in February of this year. Prior to that, calls regarding 7-OH products were classified as kratom poisonings. So it's possible that kratom is catching heat for what these concentrated, semi-synthetic products are doing. 
Similarly, the paper on drug-related mortality used the presence of metragenine in biological samples as a proxy for kratom use, which can't differentiate between metragenine that comes from kratom versus the more potent 7-OH products. In addition to the general risk of dependency, the lack of regulatory standards means these products have a high risk of inconsistency in both strength and actual chemical composition. So even if you think you know what you're getting, you can't really be sure. When the DEA tried to make kratom a controlled substance, they were thwarted by advocacy groups who believed that it should be available as an option to help people trying to get off opioids that have a much higher risk of overdose. It's sort of like how vaping has been framed as an alternative for people who would like to quit the more harmful activity of smoking cigarettes. Which can be a helpful tool, but the availability of vapes has also caused people who wouldn't otherwise use nicotine to now develop a dependency. But there's so little data around 7-OH use in humans, it's hard to know if these particular products might have a benefit to people attempting harm reduction, or if they're simply the new cigarettes rather than the new vapes. An argument could be made that limiting 7-OH availability could remove it as a gateway drug to other, more potent substances that people turn to when their tolerance increases beyond what kratom or kratom-like products can give them. Things like the full opioid agonist, Tianeptine, which is also available in many vape shops and gas stations under the names Zaza, Tiana, Neptune's Fix, and the incredibly misleading Devil's Kratom. Because the compound includes similar physical sensations and risk of dependency to some very strong opioids, more than a few people have taken to calling it gas station heroin. If 7-OH products are to kratom, what high sugar influencer smoothies are to health foods, then Tianeptine is a baker's dozen of donuts. While the opioid epidemic has conditioned most of us to have a knee-jerk and exclusively negative reaction to anything that even resembles an opioid, some are wondering if we might be overlooking the potential benefits these substances could provide if used in the right context. For Health Wanted, I'm Laurel Bristow.